Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Ian Watson and I uh, work for Volac. I'm delighted to be able to introduce the next speaker, Greg Bethard. Now, Greg's uh, full biography can be found on page 37 of the, uh, of the notes, but I've just pulled out a few key points from that, really. Um, Greg studied at uh, Virginia Tech and then moved on uh, to the New Mexico State University and Monsanto dairy business. From there, he has then uh, been involved in GNR Dairy Consulting, which is run with his wife. This um, consultancy business has uh, taken Greg to uh, far corners of the world, but also spent a lot of time in Italy. But this is actually Greg's first, um, first time in the UK, so you're very welcome over here, Greg. Um, today, as you can see, on, uh, we're going to move on and, and talk about subjects very close to my heart, which is the rearing of uh, heifers, heifer calves. In, uh, in my eyes, they're very much seen as, or quite often seen as, the poor relation to the, uh, to the dairy cow. And uh, I, I actually think they're as important, if not more important, because these are the future of the dairy herd. Now, I was um, recently involved in the judging of the Heifer Rearing Award, which the winner will be announced next week at the Livestock event, which was sponsored by XL Vets, British Dairying and Volac. And I was actually uh, astounded reading through all the applications we had in the number that didn't know how much it cost them to rear the replacements. And, and, and some of the costs that were put down weren't very accurate at all. And it's a figure there that has a, an overall impact on, on the farm profitability. Uh, and I'm very much one for measure and then change on, on the results that you're getting instead of moving towards gut feel and just changing what you think needs changed. Now, I would um, suggest uh, overall that we should have very key monitors uh, in terms of what the economics are uh, and, and how they're recorded and then what you do with them. And uh, you look at the dairy, the, 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 the dairy herd, the milk and cows, there are a lot of measurements financially and performance wise and I think we've got a job really to do to try and pull a lot more of those through into the heifer rearing enterprise. So without further ado I'd just like to introduce, um, ask Greg to come up and, and, and present his presentation. I'm very interested in what he's got to say about the monitoring of the economics. Okay. Okay, thank you. Is uh, the microphone working? Yeah. Everything sounds good. All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I've never been to England before, never been to the UK. So uh, my wife and daughter are with me. We're having a great time. Uh, thank you very much for the invite to be here. Uh, my topic today is replacement economics. Tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit about feeding economics. So my, my business as a consultant has evolved over the years, and I do more financial work than I've ever done. I've always uh, found an interest in that. So I tend to relate most questions about a dairy back to the P&L. You know, it's, it's a business. The goal is to make money. That it, we're not doing this for shits and giggles. We're doing it because we want to make money. And so everything we look at in a dairy, from my viewpoint, I want to go back to the P&L and say, what's the impact? And how can we approve the, the P&L? So this is one portion of that. And if I can get my pointer here to work, maybe I need to turn it on. There we go. Okay, some concepts I'd like to get across today that I think they're important is number one, benchmarking is a really bad idea, no matter how you go about it. I'll throw a bunch of numbers out today and tomorrow, and you think of these as goals or set points to maybe start looking at, but it is terribly inappropriate to benchmark across dairies and virtually any number you want to look at. It's fraught with error. We're frequently comparing apples and oranges. I'm going to talk a lot about cost per liter or cost per hundred weight, as we would call it, and that is absolutely not something you want to benchmark between dairies. It just doesn't make sense. So goal setting and tracking makes a lot of sense. Grabbing a benchmark and comparing to another herd doesn't make a lot of sense at all. The lowest cost per liter typically wins. Okay, there's some problems with cost per liter, and we'll get into that a little bit today and tomorrow, but at the end of the day, that typically wins, and knowing cost per liter and tracking that is obviously critical. Most areas in the U.S. are not able to give me a P&L on a liter or 100-weight basis. 
this, even those that do, the majority of them aren't doing it correctly and come up with a statement that really doesn't mean a whole lot. Most dairies have three enterprises, and we often don't think of it this way, but there really are three enterprises, a replacement enterprise, which is what the topic today is, potentially a farming enterprise, and a milking enterprise. A dairy need not have all three. A dairy needs to have the milking enterprise, but the other two are optional. And in our industry in the U.S., with farming being such a great business to have, a lot of dairies have shifted to say, gee, we want to get in that business too. It's a good business to be in, partners well with a dairy. But I think of farming as more of a hedge, and we'll get into that tomorrow more when we look at some feed costs. But those are three distinct enterprises. We can capture those all on one P&L. We don't have to enterprise account. And the cost of too many heifers or too much calling or too much turnover, all those kind of questions, we tend to look at the wrong metrics to answer those. Things like coal rate, things like how many heifers we got, but really replacement costs as we go through this answers all those questions and the goal is to replace our herd efficiently. There's a lot of ways to go about that, but that's the ultimate expression. Coal rate is a number uh, overall that just doesn't mean much to a dairy. Okay. So some relevant questions that, that I'm getting as I, as I go around the U.S., dairymen in our country have. I don't know about your country not having been on many dairies here. Uh, should I call it 50%? We've got massive heifer inventories on dairies because we've been able to get cows pregnant at a shocking rate in the last five to six years. Uh, my wife and I have a business where we process records on about 250,000 cows around the U.S., all large dairies, uh, about 100 dairies, and the average 21-day pregnancy rate, and again, don't, not a benchmarkable number, apples and oranges, just take that raw number across the board, all those dairies, it's about 24%, 24%, holy crap. Five years ago, I was happy when we hit one cycle at 20. Now we're averaging mid-20s across all those dairies. So we have uh, phenomenally improved reproductively, big heifer herds, opportunity to cull at a very high level. Should we do that? Should I raise all these heifers? How many heifers do I, do I need to maintain my herd size? What does cull rate really mean? So we'll try to answer some of those questions today, use the replacement cost concept to go about that. So the top three costs of producing milk in the U.S., and I presume similar here, obviously number one is cost per liter. If you didn't know that, you're probably at the wrong meeting. This is a dairy meeting. Number two uh, is labor cost per liter. And number three is replacement cost. And this is flip-flopped. If I was here three years ago, or two years ago even, I would have told you that replacement cost is the number two cost of producing milk on U.S. dairies. Had been for many, many years. That's flip-flop. And replacement is the only area of our P&L that's getting lower and lower and lower. We're replacing our herds more, more efficient than we ever have before. The challenge here is that most accounting systems don't put expenses in the proper bucket. So these three items together are going to be 70 plus percent of the cost of producing milk. Yet most dairies cannot distinguish the three. All right, things like labor, cropping expenses, allocating into these three buckets. If it doesn't happen, we might as well lump all together. So tomorrow we'll talk more about this feed cost, number one here, what goes into it, how to measure it, how it ought to be calculated. But replacement cost per liter is where we're going to put things like heifer feed costs. We're going to capture those in a variety of different ways, but the feed that goes to heifers does not belong in number one. The labor that goes to raising calves and raising heifers does not belong in number two. All right. The replacement enterprise is cat is replacement enterprise is captured as its own system on the dairy and we don't want to confuse things going on in that business with other parts of the business. All right. So the two key drivers of financial success for me, looking at a P&L, uh, first of all, liters of milk sold. We can't escape the fact of the, the uh, dilution effect of more milk. Dr. Fetro is going to talk some more about this, I think, today and tomorrow. Just the simple marginal economics of we can figure out how to get 1,000 more liters a day out of the door of that dairy without more capital investment. That wins every day of the year. It can be more milk per cow, but also fundamentally keeping the dairy full day after day after days, figuring out how to get more cows in there is one of the best investments a dairy can make. So more, uh, the uh, quantity of milk sold per day, number two, Gordy talked a lot about herd health, and boy, I couldn't agree more. To me, herd health drives the P&L. There's many aspects of the P&L that are directly related to herd health. Uh, it drives milk, pregnancies, replacement costs, cow flow, absolutely drives the P&L. And a healthy herd offers the opportunity to have a low replacement cost and a high coal rate. 
It doesn't happen with unhealthy cows. So we'll see that as we get through this. But that's a unique thing in our business now with the low trading values that we can have a high coal rate at a low replacement cost. That is almost always a win-win. Very unique situation now. Okay, so replacement cost again is the number three cost of producing milk. It's the only item we've got that's at an all-time low. It's getting uh, cheaper and cheaper, okay? So what is replacement cost? Well, it is not a universal dairy term. This did not originate in the dairy industry. We tend to think since the word replacement is in there, in the U.S. we call heifers replacements, that we tend to think, gee, this is a dairy term. We're kind of arrogant and think, well, gee, some smart California accountant came up with a concept. Not true. It's a manufacturing principle. All right. So if you had a factory and your factory had machines in it that made a widget or some sort of device, and you had 100 of those machines lined, up, your replacement cost would be the cost of maintaining all those hundred machines in line day after day after day. And well, occasionally some of those machines fail, they break, they have these problems, and you as a business owner decide, well, gee, I might pull that machine out of line and fix it, or it might be so badly damaged and have so little salvage that I say, gee, I'm going to get rid of it and get a new one to take its place, all right? So the replacement cost is the cost of keeping those 100 machines in your factory running day after day after day. So for a dairy, which is also a manufacturing business, it's the same concept that if we've got a 100 cow capacity in our facility, what's the cost of keeping 100 cows in that facility day after day after day after day? We could execute that in a variety of manners. We could call it 70%, we could call it 10%, we could raise our own heifers, we could buy our own heifers, we could buy milking cows. There's a lot of ways to execute that, that strategy of keeping the barn full day after day after day. Replacement cost just captures the cost of maintaining your herd size, all right? There's a lot of ways to do it. All right, so uh, uh, again, for the dairy business, we'd state this just simply, the cost of maintaining herd size and structure. So we're not replacing, you know, Jer uh, Gordysville brown cows. We're not replacing them with goats. We're replacing them with like animals. So as long as we replace them, keep the structure and size the same. But this, uh, there's a couple methods that, that we like to use to capture this. The accountants in the U.S. typically use what's called gap accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. And this is going to use a depreciated value of cows, right? So it's going to consider depreciation on cows. And I've always felt that a dairy herd doesn't depreciate. So go to one of your dairies, or those of you that are dairymen, think about the value of your herd today, however many cows you've got in your facility, the value of that herd, is that changing year to year? Was that herd worth less last year? Is it going to be worth less next year? I'd argue no, and you shouldn't be fooling with your balance sheets adjusting cow values. So I don't think a dairy herd really changes value year in and year out. I think it stays the same. For tax purposes, you certainly want to depreciate an individual cow. Uh, but a, a dairy cow is a unique asset. When we think of a tractor, what's the value of de what is the, the definition of depreciation? The decline in the value of an asset over time. And a dairy herd doesn't decline in value over time, provided you're replacing the herd. So depreciation, I don't think really fits. One of the prime di differences is a, uh, a tractor doesn't spurn little baby tractors to take its place, right? So, so dairy cows are a little unique of an asset that they can replace themselves internally. So one other problem with that is, one, there's not really depreciation with this gap methodology. It is also a lagging methodology. Meaning that if you consider depreciated values of cows, you're considering the value when they were put in service, which is perhaps three or four years ago. So let's say right now you're calculating your replacement costs using gap methodology and heifer prices go up extraordinarily. Your replacement costs on your P&L are going to reflect cow values from two, three, and four years ago. You're not going to be reflecting what's going on today. So I think it makes more sense to use this cash method that I'm talking about, which we'll go through, which uses current values today and really reflects how your business is today and decisions going forward in the near-term future on trading cows. All right. So this cash method is just simple as could be. This is kindergarten math. We, we certainly don't need a spreadsheet for this. We barely need a calculator. So it's just the cost of replacements, all the replacements on a dairy over a period of time, minus value of sold cows divided by liters or 100 weights of milk sold. That's just as simple as it gets. It is a trade-in formula, a trade-in formula. So the cost of replacements we'll talk here a little bit about. Value of sold cows is a hidden one, and that's where herd health really kills you. 
So if you don't follow Gordy's dry cow program and you get lots of metritis and DAs and beat up fresh cows, what's the value of the cows you're shipping? In our country, they'd probably be $300 cows you're shipping. Don't weigh a lot, packers don't want them, not a lot, a lot of good beef, but what if the cows that you are selling are late lactation, fat cows that you couldn't get pregnant, you're beefing them at 400 days in milk, in our industry, they're gonna bring about $1,100, $1,200. That's a very different scenario, the type of cow you're feeding. We tend to think of uh, uh, beef cows leaving a dairy as kind of a shameful thing, as uh, 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 once we, uh, we failed on this cow, she's leaving our dairy, when it's actually a value-added byproduct leaving our production facility. Just like any other manufacturing facility, a lot of them have byproducts that have value, and in our business in the U.S., this is a high-value product coming out the back end of our plant. We need to consider the value of that. If we're selling healthy, good, fat cows, we're going to lower our replacement costs, even we turn more over. And then value of sold cows, what are dead cows selling for in, in the UK right now? Not very good, and they don't sell very good in the US yet. So if you run a 10% death loss, uh, you're not selling a lot of cows. So I was at a dairy two months ago that had a 25, 24, 25% coal rate, and they were very proud of that coal rate and felt very good that they didn't coal a lot of cows, and they had a 12% death loss. 50% of their coals were dead. Their replacement costs were higher than they should have been despite a low coal rate because they weren't selling any beef. And the animals they did sell were flat, wore out. They waited too long to sell them. They wrung everything they could out of them. There wasn't anything left. The salvage value was almost nothing. All right. So this is a trading concept. And it makes most sense when you think about a vehicle. As Americans, we kind of like our cars. So let's say you bought a uh, brand new pickup truck or a brand new car a year ago, and you paid $50,000 or 50,000 pounds for this car. And you drive it for a year, and you just run it, take it on dairy that smells like manure or butyric acid, and you bring it back a year later, and the dealer says, for $2,000, for $2,000, I'll trade you in on a brand new car. What would you do? Everybody, hell yeah, I'd take that, right? Not only would you take it, if you knew the same deal was going to be there next year, you'd run the wheels off that damn thing. You wouldn't change the oil, you wouldn't fix the tires, you'd just run it for a year, and you wouldn't feel guilty about it. You'd say, man, that's a great deal. For $2,000, I traded in on a new one, I do it every year. I don't care how often I did it, I keep doing it. Now, what if you came back instead and the dealer said, well, that car, I'll trade you in on a new one, but it's going to cost you 20000 if it were me, I'd say, mm, I think I'll wait. I'll put a few more miles on that car, and I'll keep this thing a little bit longer, get my total cost of operation down. So that trade-in value defines this decision. That margin is all that matters. It doesn't matter what heifers cost. It doesn't matter uh, what beef cows are bringing. What matters is that margin or difference. That defines this decision, and that's what we got to track, and that's what we got to know. So this is just simply a trade-in concept. So I pull this off. You've got a wonderful website here in the UK with all kinds of market data. I presume that it's accurate. So I'm looking at coal cow prices. This is uh, July of 09 here on the left side, going through April 13, and boy, they've dramatically gone up. You've got an unusual pricing system that we don't, that, that you look at the price of, you can't read my legend at the bottom, dairy sired versus beef sired coal cows. They bring a very different price, but the point here is that your trend has been similar to ours. The value of beef cows has gone up dramatically, and a lot of producers haven't thought about too much. So what are current trade-in values? This is what it showed uh, 120 to 150 pence per kilo, depending on whether it was a, a, call, a beef sire or not. Uh, so heifers were about $1,650 is what that website said. I don't know if that's accurate or not. You can tell me. So based on that math, your trade-in values are between $700 and $800. That's about double what most of our trading values now are in the U.S., all right? So uh, higher trading values. I don't know if that's truly the case on your dairies or if this has changed over time, but that's the number to track. This number right here defines uh, what the, the replacement decision ought to be, and uh, we can model that very, very easily, okay? So uh, think about... Um, uh, looking about cost of ownership on a cow, it kind of sums up that, that uh, salvage value ownership discussion. Again, we need our, the cows that we have in our facilities are productive assets that we need to keep as long as they're productive assets, but be willing to trade in before it's too late. Now I see most U.S. dairymen making a mistake of holding on to the cow too long so she doesn't have enough value and increasing our total cost. So if we uh, say we 
pay uh, 1,600 pounds for a heifer to come into our herd, either raising her or buying her. Well, the day that she, uh, uh, the first day of lactation, hopefully she has a little baby. Let's say that's worth 50 pounds. So that means our net, our net at day one is in this case $1,550. And let's say we kept a heifer for 400 days. We didn't get her pregnant, we milked her for 400 days, and then we got rid of her. So we'd salvage her at $800, okay, salvage her beef. This is just like any other asset calculation we do, a tractor, a TMR mixer, same exact concept. We'd salvage her at 800, so the net cost of ownership here is 750 pounds. 750 pounds. Divide that by the 400 days we had her, the cost of ownership is $1.88 a day. And in our country, we'd get something like $2,500 income over fee cost on that cow and that lactation. So that's not a loss if we can get rid of that animal 400 days, all right? But if we don't follow Gordy's dry cow program and we kill that heifer at five days of age or beef her for $200, this becomes an absorbently expensive equation, all right? So again, it depends when we're moving the cows out. Um, the cost of ownership today is lower than it's ever been. Ours in the U.S. right now is close to half of that. Okay, so I assume this is right for your country. Okay, so the cost of replacement, the first part of that formula, just go through a few things here. Uh, we're really just adding up feed and other costs. We could put in a constant value for heifers. But I want to talk about a few impacts on here uh, relative to breeding. It's staggering to me how many dairies know how to get cows pregnant, have great systems, uh, uh, good breeders, well-managed dairies, but yet they struggle to get heifers pregnant quickly enough. They think they're doing okay because they're looking at the wrong metrics, but it's a big opportunity. In an era of high feed costs, days on feed is a killer for heifers. So this is a look at a distribution of calving and really looking at when heifers calve is really the inappropriate way to do this because we're really seven and a half months late. We need to be looking at when they got pregnant, but this was easy to put in a graph. So look at this distribution. This is a herd with a 23-month age of first calving. So we've got a distribution of uh, each month. So the first month they started coming in here, the 21st month, 9% of them freshened. The second month, 47%. The third month, 25%. Here's another dairy, okay, with a 24 month age at first calving, okay? And they started bringing them in at about the same time. But look at the tail on that distribution, and they're not calving heifers quickly enough, i.e., they're not getting heifers pregnant quickly. And uh, so pregnancy rate, I mentioned across all those dairies, was 24% for the milking herd. I see many dairies where the pregnancy rate on virgin heifers is lower than it is on milking cows, solely because service rate isn't there, because they're not putting the effort forth that they are on the milking herd. So looking at these two, those previous two slides stacked on top of one another, on that top, top slide, they're getting 72% of them freshening in a two-month window. The bottom slide, 51%. They're just slow at getting them pregnant. And the, the, the secret to this is not to shift this distribution to the left, it's to tighten that distribution up. The problem we have, the wider this distribution gets, the bigger the tail. For one thing, we're getting more days on feed on average, which is expensive. In the U.S., we're about $2 to $2.50 for extra, every extra day on feed. And this creates a non-uniform heifer population. So we go into a close-up pen or go into a fresh pen and we see fat heifers, we maybe see thin heifers, we see all over the board. So if we have animals that are calving with a distribution spanning a five-month window, likely they all went through the same feeding program, they all went through the same system, and it's really hard to get uniform, uniform animals in terms of condition and size when we've got that big of a spread and age with which you're coming in. So this is a, a just simple graph, a scatter graph of days at first breeding. These are all first services on this graph for heifers. And th these axes are hard for you to see, but on the right-hand side is uh, current time. On the left, on the x-axis here is uh, a year ago. And the y-axis is days or age at first breeding. And what you'll see on this area is a spread Okay, this is about 385 days. My pointer is not going to really work here. About a 385 days at the bottom, and we got about 420, 430 days at the top. And look at how many of those first breedings are 430, 440, 450 days, uh, and they're just flat not getting done. This is a herd with almost a 30% pregnancy rate uh, in the milking herd, and what they're doing is moving heifers into the group every other week, and they're just not getting semen in quick enough. So again, a shot of lutealites 
is two dollars, two dollars and fifty cents in our country. An extra day on feed is two dollars and two dollars and fifty cents. We can justify the expense of getting these heifers pregnant quicker and lowering that days on feed. Unfortunately, we frequently look at the wrong metric. This is conception rate and many breeders, many dairies are stuck on conception rate on heifers. It's a highly biased number. We ignore the animals we didn't breed and we can absolutely get misled. The next two slides are from the same dairy. This is a 64% conception rate. Whenever I see a 75 or an 80% conception rate, I smell skunk and the skunk that I smell is probably that the breeder is not breeding all they can. All right, they're cherry picking. So this dairy is a 64, and if we look at their 21-day pregnancy rate, uh, this dairy is running about a 48% pregnancy rate for the year on virgin heifers, just flat getting it done. Their service rate is 72%, consistently in the mid-70s on service rate. Outstanding performance, and again, this is all about people. It's all about people, it's about systems, it's about moving heifers weekly into pens, it's about lute it's about getting heifers pregnant. So again, all this is about reducing days on feed, getting heifers in quickly. I think some of the goals you like to shoot for and things to monitor is uh, uh, looking at size at the, in the breeding window, getting them pregnant quickly. This 90% bred by 21 days past the voluntary wait period is really looking at the speed with which we're getting semen into heifers and that's the common place where most people fall apart. They're just delayed in getting semen into heifers and I think a 40% pregnancy rate using a constant voluntary wait period is a very achievable number in heifers. When heifers are not getting pregnant, it's rarely the heifer that's the problem, it's almost always the people. Where with milk cows, sometimes it's uh, the cow or the people. So with an average calf program where we're not really accelerating calf growth, a 395-day voluntary wait period, we ought to be able to average 700 days of first calving. Uh, with an accelerated calf program where we can really get them off to a good start, we ought to be able to lower at that down to 370 to 380 and get a, a, a lower age of first calving. All right. So again, once we decide that they're big enough, we got them to the age, getting on them quickly is big. If we can save 10 days across all our heifers, that's $20, $25 per heifer, that's big money on the dairies that I work with, and, and we look at that very, very hard, all right? So let's look at this replacement cost formula and kind of sum all this up. So we, we, that's about all the, the uh, hardcore heifer stuff you're going to get. Let's look at a couple examples and calculate replacement costs and see how it might work. So in this uh, example, I've got four dairies, herd A, B, C, and D, put all of them at 1,000 cows from around even numbers so we don't have to get a calculator. So look at these four herds and say, okay, here's the, the milk production on those four herds. Herd A and B are both 34 liters. Kind of, I'm gonna say that's an average or more, more typical production level. Herd C is a 28 liter herd. In our country, we kind of call that maybe a low input dairy. We, we've got several of those. Herd D is a high output herd, 40, 42 liters. They're flat, doing, doing a good job, getting a lot of milk. And uh, you see how many liters a year they produce. And then look at the coal rate across those four dairies. Herd A and B are both 35% coal rate. All right. Herd C being a low input, low coal rate, kind of what you'd hope to expect to see. And herd D, 45%. And they're just burning them up. All right. So look at those four. And which one do you think has the lowest replacement cost? Which herd is most efficiently replacing itself? So here's some D. Here's some C. The answer is we don't have a freaking clue because we don't know, have any more information. So we got to learn a little bit more. So let's see what we can figure out. But this, uh, how often on a dairy, this is where we stop, where we gauge replacement success. We know how much milk, we know whether coal rate, we got all we need to know to judge the dairy and we don't even uh, come close to knowing. So let's learn a little bit more. So on this dairy, if I can get my thing here to work. Okay, there's our death loss. So herd A is a 5% death loss. Herd B, 10%. All right, so now we're starting to see some differences. And I set these up to see different dairies that I see in the U.S. Herd C is 5%, herd D is 5%. All right. Uh, in fact, herd A and B, before I put up the death loss, what was the difference between herd A and B? No. They were identical, right? They were identical. Coal rate was the same, milk was the same. Identical herds. So now we uh, look at the number of animals they got a cull, all right, and the dollars we're getting per cull. So look at herd B, they're only getting 300 pounds on average for their cows. Herd A, C, and D are getting 600 pounds on average, right? So I'm creating this scenario, herd B is holding on to cows too long, they haven't got the pregnancies, they don't have the cow flow, and by the time they get rid of them, they are flat worn out, flat worn out, okay? So realize on my coal right here, uh, that doesn't include, or it does include death loss, so in herd A, for instance, they're selling 30% of their herd, 30%. 
35 is the coal rate, 5 is death loss, so they're netting 30, all right? So we got a different cost on heifers coming in, all right? So I got 1,500 uh, pounds for all the heifers coming in across all four dairies, different number of placements. So then we come to the end to our math, and lo and behold, herd B is getting their butts kicked. All right, they're about a pound off of everybody else. All right, a pound per 100 liters. Uh, and you look at herd A is 327, herd C is 294, herd D is 334, all right? And you see that, boy, there's not a lot of difference there, not a lot of difference. So we think about these, and, and let's do one more thing here. Look at my trade-in values. I've got a 900-pound trade-in value on herd A, C, and D. What if I trade that change that trade in value. Let's lower that trade in value down to 500 pounds, all right? Now look at what we got and herd A, C, and D largely come together. There's not a hill of beans difference between those, all right? Uh, 204 versus $1.90 versus 203. Financially, there's very little cost of that higher calling. So if you have a dairy and you sit around with your partners and get a list of what you're good at and rank the things that you do well as a business, if number one on that list is you don't call many cows and our country, you better find something else you're good at because there's not a lot of economic value in that anymore. Five years ago, there was huge economic value in that because our trade-in values were $1,500 to $2,000. Today, they're less than $500. There's not the value in a low coal rate that, it, that there used to be. So what we can learn here is one, herd D, we can turn a lot of cows over, but if the herd is healthy, meaning we're not killing many of them, and the ones we do sell bring good beef price, we can call an awful lot of cows and have a very good replacement cost. And I'm assuming, uh, or, or one thing we could assume here is different levels of milk with more calling. And I'm not really bumping that up, but we can call a lot of cows. But herd D is the riskiest model up here. It's the riskiest model. So what happens if herd D is getting 42 liters? They put up bad silage one year, what have you. They drop down to 38 liters. So they say, man, we got to get more milk. So they break all their philosophies. They start pushing cows. They cause health problems. And what happens if herd D runs a 45% coal rate with a 10% death loss and the value of cows they cull drops in half? That thing spins catastrophically out of control. So herd D is a risky model, and it is absolutely predicated on herd health. And we all know that we can have healthy cows and high production, but if we don't do that, replacement cost is where we get beat up, all right? So uh, herd B in this is the absolute loser, and unfortunately, we have lenders and professionals who will go to a herd B and say, gee, you guys need to get more milk per cow, so push them harder and quit calling so many because you're going to go broke with all the cold cows. And actually, what herd B needs to do is turn over a bunch of cows real quickly, fix its health problem, and that's the only chance you're going to get out of it. If they keep trying to cull fewer cows and keep trying to push for milk, that's going to, thing going to be a death spiral of a dairy going out of business, okay? All right, so watch out with too much calling. So based on that slide, you may say, well, hell, we can call 70%. We can call 80%, right? Well, I think there's a point where we do have some problems. There's two watch outs in my mind where we've turned over too many cows. One is we get too many D and Bs, which are do not breeds, cows that we label that we don't want to get them pregnant. It's a great management tool. But if we get so many that our hard counts on pregnancies drop, we got a cow flow problem. Cow flow is fundamentally crucial to the financial success of a dairy. So we can have lots of DNBs. I've got herds with 10%, but if your pregnancy rate was 20% at zero DNBs and it's still 20% with now 10% DNBs, you have slid a lot reproductively. Okay, so we got to focus a little bit on that hard count. And number two, if we end up with too many first lactation animals, they don't milk as well as cows in the herds that I see. And so if you get up to 50, 55% first lactation, you're going to uh, harm your tank average. You're not going to get quite the milk out the door. So I'm seeing herds that are calling in the mid to high 40s mid to high 40s with 40% first lactation. What does that tell you? It tells you if she's a shitty first lactation cow, they're not going to let her be a shitty second lactation cow. She's going to have that career change that Gordy was talking about. Okay? And so they're very aggressively getting rid of the, the first lactation cows that aren't very good and not offering them a second chance. So again, calling pressure on lactation equal one. To me, those are the, really the only two watch outs. We can turn over a lot of cows provided our replacement costs stay in line and we don't break these two rules. Uh, I think we can go where we want to. So here's an example of taking a, a low coal rate herd and upping the coal rate and saying, gee, what do these numbers look like? So 
The good thing about this replacement cost formula, it's as simple as pie. You can jump on Excel like I did. This isn't Excel, but it came from Excel. And you can model this 10 ways to Sunday. It's really, really simple. You don't even have, have to hardly know Excel to do it. So what I did here is say, okay, we got a, a $1,000 trade-in value or a 1,000 pound trade-in value. Again, that defines this equation, the trade-in value. So $500 calls and $1,500 replacements. Um, and let's say we take our call rate from 35 to 50. So we go to a herd with a 35 call rate and say, gee, we're going to find some problem cows out there, turn over more, and see the impact of that. So at this high, uh, at this higher trade in value, I'm going to say, gee, we get another uh, three liters per cow. Look at our cost of high calling. 1.06 pounds per liter. We can make a very good argument that we can make that cost up elsewhere in the P&L. And I think in a lot of cases we can. But that's still not an insignificant cost. A pound per liter in my book is a significant cost. So we better be sure we're making that up elsewhere. Now let's say if this same scenario occurs where our trade-in values are lower, so instead of a thousand pound trade-in value, now we have a 300 pound trade-in value, all right? Completely different market scenario. Now look at the cost of high calling, 0.28 or 28 pence per, per 100 liters. That cost is one I feel sure we can make up elsewhere with a dilution over more milk. So again, watching this trade-in value is crucial to executing it to say, gee, if I'm gonna go out and find more cows, to get rid of on my dairy. I've got heifers coming in. I've got good cow flow. I'm going to look at maybe getting rid of a few more. The economics are pretty, pretty simple to look at. It's unique to each dairy, um, but the math is not hard, and we can come up with a value and model this and see if we can make it up elsewhere. All right. So if we look at this across a whole herd, I'm going to go through a couple things here to, to kind of finish up. Um, looking at, uh, I'm going to take a base 3,200 cow herd, no magic in the herd size, and I'm going to say, okay, uh, I, I got a, a trade-in value here of 900 pounds, and all my math based on my production, I'm going to say my replacement cost per 100 liters calculates out to 3.07 pounds. All right, 3.07 pounds. So what I'm going to do is change that change this herd and we're going to call more cows and we're going to tr change the trade in value and kind of see what the relative impacts are to see what ha has more impact on this cost. So this is at the left hand bar here. I start at my 35 call rate and I've got a, that $3.07 trade in value and all I'm doing is escalating call rate from 35 to 36 to 37 to 38 all the way up to 44%. So I jumped 11 points of coal rate. That's a big change in coal rate, all right? And look what we did to replacement costs. They're going up a little bit, I'm assuming. No more milk, no more milk, just calling more cows. So we're not having a huge impact on replacement costs just simply by calling more cows with no change in performance. It's meaningful, but it's not huge. If I repopulate the same graph, and instead of changing the coal rate, I change that trade-in value, we'll see that this looks quite a bit different. And my trade-in value, I started out to 900 pounds, and as that thing starts going up, if that thing starts going up, my replacement costs are spiraling out of control when that thing goes up and up and up at a 35 coal rate. So this trade-in value is crucial. So dairies need to do everything they can to protect the value of their beef cows. Market beef cows to the right market to get maximum value. I don't know what that is in, in, in the UK, but all, all of you ought to ask yourself, am I getting the most value out of my beef cows? Am I selling them at the right time to get the maximum value? Am I holding on to cows too long? Think about the cost uh, of what you're willing to invest in that manufacturing asset in your business. So if you've got a cow with a trade-in value of maybe 500 pounds, are you gonna invest 300 pounds in that cow in some sort of treatment? Are you willing to pull that asset out of line, invest a lot of money in that asset just to, to throw her back in line, or would you rather trade in on a new one? Early dry cows, are you willing to dry a cow and offer her a 100-day dry period? A 100-day dry period, think of what you're, you're gonna invest in that cow, a dry period is an investment in another lactation. So a 100-day dry period, if it costs you three euros a day to feed that dry cow, you're gonna invest 300 euros to start another lactation. So which cows show up on the early dry list? Shitty cows, right? Usually your all-stars don't show up on the early dry list. So if you invest $300 in a dry period on a shitty cow, what do you have 100 days later? A shitty cow with a baby, right? So I don't know that's really gotten us anything. So uh, we really need to think hard about investing in DA surgeries and treatments and uh, trying to fix cows and repair cows. It doesn't have the value it did. The Save a Cow program in our country worked great for many, many, many years. We trained herds people and good cow people to fix cows. 
fix them, band-aid them, let's get them back in line, and that doesn't make sense like it used to. So I'm finding people getting very aggressive with good heifer populations and say, hey, uh, I'm not willing to spend uh, a lot of money. I can trade her in a new one a lot easier. Back to the car analogy, you know, if your car comes down with a blown transmission, are you willing to invest $3,000 in a new transmission in your car, or are you going to junk it and get another one? All right, similar type of thought process. Okay, so now let's get to the marginal calling decision. I know Dr. Fetcher is going to emphasize marginality, which is a critical concept. So I focused on the average replacement value, but let's just for a moment think about the marginal replacement value. So let's say we're at that 35 coal rate with that 307 replacement cost. Back to that base herd that I started with. And let's say, well, gee, the extra cows that we're going to cull, that extra beef cow we're going to find, she's not the average cow. She's probably a fatter cow, a late lactation cow, one that just isn't a great producer. So her marginal trade-in value is going to be less than the average. So in this case, I said that marginal trade-in value is only 300 pounds. And I think that more closely represents reality when we go out and find those fat girls and look at the impacts on uh, raising, uh, increasing coal rate with a small marginal value. I can go from 35 to 49 percent coal rate and only increase my replacement cost 37 cents, almost nothing. So again, we need to focus on that trade in value, but really think about that marginal trade. That last cow I'm going to find out there that maybe she's just not a good cow, she's got a below average ME, she's got a foot pro, whatever what's that cow worth relative to replacing her? And I think a lot of herds have opportunities to turn that kind of cow over and make a more efficient operation. When we look at feed conversions on a dairy, which I'll talk some about tomorrow, what's the feed conversion on a hospital pen? Ain't too good, is it, right? They eat a lot of feed and don't produce any milk. So sticking cows in a hospital and investing money in them is hard to justify. So last, we'll finish up here. Do we have too many heifers? This seems to be the question of the day in our industry. We got heifers coming out of our ears. And to me, I look at a heifer herd as a hedge. A heifer herd is a hedge, just like farming for a dairy is a hedge. It gives options, it gives flexibility, and it prevents uh, the dairy to getting caught in a market situation or a herd health scenario where they have a difficult time getting their way out of it. Uh, I don't know what your lenders are like, but our lenders, if you go to the lender and say, I need money to buy heifers because I had a mastitis outbreak or I had this problem, our borrowing base constraints sometimes make it impossible for a dairy to buy heifers without capital calls. And capital calls are bad for most dairies. So borrowing base issues will mean a dairy has its hands tied, they can't buy heifers, and they end up holding on to cows too long, uh, they're not able to keep their facility full, and that's a death knell for a dairy of not being able to stay full. So having a strong heifer herd, again, is a hedge against that. So just crudely, this is what I always kind of, I pulled this out of my butt. There was certainly no science behind it, not even some mathematics. I said, gee, about 110% of milking herd just kind of crudely always seemed to work for the herds I work with. So that's a milking number. So I'm taking percentage of uh, milking cows for heifers that are less than 24 months of age. So I'm not counting all those old ones. I'm saying, hey, the younger population, that's kind of what I always thought. So somebody challenged me on this more than once. I decided, well, I probably ought to put a little math to it. This isn't science, just a little bit of math on a spreadsheet. So how many heifers you need depends on what coal rate you think you will have, which boy, that's a hell of a guess, what you think you're going to cull in two years, right? When you're, when you're making baby calf decisions. And then the survival rate of calves that are born on your dairy. So if you kill a lot of your calves, you're going to need a bigger heifer herd, right, to maintain, uh, to keep them coming through. And if you cull more cows, you're going to need a bigger cull rate. So the numbers that I track on dairies, I'm seeing survival rates, including DOAs, in that 80% range is typical. There's some dairies that do a lot better, some dairies that do a lot worse. And I like myself in today's environment with our trading values to be able to turn the herd over at 40 to 42%, 43%. I think that's a good hedge. Again, you could argue against that and that's fine, but based on that, if you look at the 80% survival, the 42 to 44, I'm right in that 105% range is kind of where these numbers uh, work out to me. So you can look across this table and think, well, gee, this is where I think I ought to be. This is most, uh, most fits my operation, and gauge your heifer herd based on that. I know some herds that are sitting down in the 80s here, and they're saying, man, we only need 80% of milking cows and heifers, and that's okay, but boy, if they get a wreck, hopefully they can go out and buy heifers to fill a hole, but I ask 
absolutely am so uh, committed to cow flow being hinged to financial success that if we put the dairy in a position where they cannot maintain cow flow, it kills the dairy financially. And so again, I look at this as one big hedge, uh, and I think you need to look on your dairy about resources, uh, you know, whether you, you're able to handle this many heifers and what makes sense for your business. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all, but I think you need to know the factors that go into making that decision. Okay, so if we sum all this together, this is the last slide, and look at, gee, how much milk do we need to pay if we're going to cull a lot higher? So let's just look at a, a marginal value of milk. So I put in a, a marginal value of milk culling the feed, and I said 1,000 a thousand a pounds for those additional culls. You can run through the math on this very simple. I won't bore you with it, but we work out at the end uh, uh, 0.71 liters per day uh, uh, needed to, co to cover that extra cull rate. I went from a 35 to a 45 cull rate, added 10 points on coal rate and just a little bit of milk or pay for that and again going around the US I'm seeing more herds and I'm telling them they need to coal more not coal less where 10 years ago we kind of had the other way that you're going to more herds and saying gee you guys are turning over a lot of cows you have absorbently high replacement costs now I see more opportunities of getting inefficient manufacturing assets productive assets out of our line, getting inefficient ones out, replacing them with a newer, more efficient model. That makes a lot of sense. Again, you look at, at, at the cost of feed and the cost of ownership on cows, the cost of repairing cows, the cost of trading in cows. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to fix cows unless you really got a special cow. It doesn't make sense to early dry cows unless you've got a special cow. It makes sense to make good economic decisions on all your cows every day. What that works out on coal rate at the end of the year is really inconsequential. I think we focus on early lactation calling because as I showed earlier, early, early lactation calling is a killer on dairies because those are usually low value cows, um, but overall coal rate just really doesn't mean a lot. So we can call heavy and we can have a low replacement rate, okay?